Hello everyone. In this episode, we're going to continue our study of multiple equilibria. We're going to look beyond the general case and see a situation in which analytically we can understand that not just can there be two equilibria, but one can be Pareto preferred to another. And the failure to get to the Pareto preferred equilibrium really can represent the failure to get modernization and economic development underway, even in the first place, or to avoid getting stuck at some stage more generally. And so in order to look at this, we're going to examine a graphical version of the big push at, that is described also in the textbook. So in order to examine industrialization and modernization, it's probably necessary to consider increasing returns to scale. That is to say, there's a reason why in modern economies, factory production and other commercial activities are often done on a large scale. And so that if we think increasing returns to scale or IRS has something very much fundamental to do with economic development, we're going to have to have models that are capable of incorporating it. And so most of the basic economic models that you run into in the uh, basic uh, classes such as Econ 12 assume diminishing returns. It's a lot easier really to build models that um, have those assumptions of diminishing returns. But if we're going to do this analysis here and do so graphically and do so in a way in which we can see a lot on a single diagram, we're going to have to make more assumptions than we would under other circumstances. But some of these are really simply in order to be able to get at understanding the underlying logic. There are six assumptions that I want to draw your attention to, however. The first is that there's one factor of production. A short while ago, when we looked at the AK or Herod Domar growth model, we found that the one factor of production we were using there was capital. We also saw that it was fairly elastic in that we can think of, and some economists have modeled, capital as including human capital in addition to physical capital. Here, our one factor of production is going to be only labor. The, elastics, the, the, you know, if you want the elasticity of its interpretation in this case is going to be that it takes workers to produce capital. So we can think about the existing capital as being the result of prior work of labors. In some analyses and terminology in the past, that was known as frozen labor. Right, so then in addition, <clears throat> there are two sectors, which means there's two ways of production. One of them a modern factory or a large scale type of production. The other traditional, such as cottage industry. And this refers to the production technique. And there's the, going to be the, these same production functions that I'll give you a specific example of in a moment, modern and traditional, for each and every activity. An activity is something like making sandals. Another one is building chairs. There could be another service like delivering lunch. These are activities. Consumers spend an equal amount on each of these goods. That's for simplicity. For those of you who've seen it, it's equivalent to a Cobb Douglas utility function with equal weights on the different units of, of um, consumption. It's equivalent to a kinds of observations like consumers spend 28%, let's say, of their incomes on housing, whatever their income levels are. And so again, it's partly for simplicity to get the logic across in a simple way. We have a closed economy in this assumption, and we very importantly make a couple of industrialized uh, of uh, industrial organization assumptions here. First, within this cottage production activity, uh, such as the sandals activity, there's perfect competition. And the idea here is that if there's more money to be made producing sandals at home than doing something else, that more people will switch to production at home of sewing up some sandals. And so that is the notion of free entry and also free exit that underlies this competitive market assumed for cottage industry. And of course, also there's many producers in their cottages working. If on the other hand, we have a modern firm using the modern sector production technique in its activity, such as creates uh, sandals, boxes of sandals or whatever, then we have assumed that there's a monopolist 
First of all, because we have increasing returns to scale throughout. So thinking of it as that, we, it's like the Washington Metro. And so it's efficient to have one producer with increasing returns to scale throughout. You wouldn't have two underground metro lines right against each other competing all down G Street or whatever it might be. On the other hand, there are sharp limits to the monopoly power that they have. This is what we call a limit pricing monopolist, which you might have seen before. But the notion is that, of course, any monopolist would love to continue to raise price until it reaches the profit maximizing point. But in the case of limit pricing, our monopolist here will not be able to raise its price above what the cottage industry sellers are selling their product for. Because otherwise, those um, cottage industry potential sandal producers will jump into that activity again and make uh, money driving the price back down toward one, say. Okay, and so these are our basic assumptions. We look at this in some more specific terms when I talk about the graph, but I'm going to now move to talk about the graph, which is the equivalent to figure 4.2 in the textbook. I'm calling this one 4.2 prime because I've simplified the diagram slightly by only looking at one of the three general possible cases of what the wage bill would look like. I'm just singling out this W2 because it's the most interesting one because it happens to be the one that corresponds to multiple equilibria where we could end up with a stable equilibrium of being stuck in the traditional way of doing things or being in a stable way in the modern production situation. Other equilibria are that you never move to, the, uh, to modern production at all, or that you move immediately to modern production. But this is the more difficult case, and indeed the, the, the more interesting case. So I'm going to really focus in on this one. And so in this world, just to talk about the underlying um, ways of representing the ideas and the assumptions, First, constant returns to scale in the um, activity of producing sandals within the traditional sector. This is represented on the 45 degree line. And that's partly for simplicity. With a 45 degree line, we are first of all assuming that one worker is able to produce one sandal, or if you want, whatever they're able to produce, maybe it's three pairs of sandals, we call that one unit of sandals um, for each day. And so it's one for one. We have the number of laborers in the sector here on the x-axis, the amounts of output, not in the sector, but in the activity of sandal making specifically with the um, traditional sector way of doing so, um, labor on the x-axis, output on the y-axis. One worker in one day produces one unit of the output. And because we have a degree of freedom in deciding what we want to call one unit of currency's worth, we will say also that they sell it for one, call it dollar, um, per day. Um, per, uh, per day's uh, work. And we have degrees of freedom in how we measure things that make that as reasonable as any other kind of assumption. But it does have a lot of value for us in that we can do two things. We can think about this y-axis in terms of quantities produced, but also in terms of values. And <clears throat> that lets us look at profitability because it's profitability that will drive things. <clears throat> and in terms of the, um, the, the axes, I want to say one other thing. It's the, um, this is the amount of labor that goes into this activity, which we'll think of as sandal production, whether or not that's the traditional sector approach in the cottages or the modern sector approach in the, in the factories. How much labor goes into this activity as consumers like each um, good equally, and the way of, pro of production, the production functions are the same for all the different activities, 
producing chairs, producing sandals, producing services, whatever you know it might be, then the amount has to do with the overall labor force in the whole economy, this capital L. That could be, if we want to imagine this as Ethiopia, it may be 50 million workers in Ethiopia. And the amount who are involved in the activity of sandal production will be one nth of all the activities. So we divide the total amount of labor uh, force in, the, in Ethiopia by, let's say, 2,000, some large number like that, if there's 2,000 different activities, such as our sandal making and our chair making. So this is the amount of labor and it corresponds to this amount of output Q1, normalizing the price to one, this is also the value of output for the traditional sector. So this is constant returns to scale. What I want to do now is to look at the modern production function. And so in order to do that, at this moment, I'm going to start with a fresh picture here. What I want to call your attention to first with respect to the modern production function is that you have to use F workers before you can produce anything at all. And so that this is how we introduce increasing returns to scale. You can think of this as being a representation that there is capital, but this is the amount of workers it took to build the factory and the machines and so on. Or you can just say that it takes a certain number of workers, F workers, in a factory before anything can be produced at all, because you have perhaps a complex set of assembly lines that all have to work together. And unless you have some minimum number of workers, not one person is going to be able to operate anything in the factory to produce something. Either way, the assumption is you can't produce until you have F workers. However, after that point, these workers can produce more efficiently than we see in the traditional sector. Because after all, what would be the point now that we have this cost? So the rest of the production function is this straight line. And this gives us increasing returns to scale because you'll see that the higher the amount of um, workers, the greater the output per worker will be because you're in a sense amortizing across these F workers. I'll leave that to you as an exercise. But the notion here is that our production function looks to be in two line segments if you don't like that, let me just point out and note that you can think of these two line segments as an approximation for, an, for a um, production function that's increasing at, a, at an increasing rate. So it may be an approximation for something that really looks like this. So that's our modern production function. And now what I want to do is to take a look at the decision that the potential entrepreneur might make who has this modern production function. Do they enter, do they start working in the market or not? And as we might expect, we're going to assume they will make the decision based upon whether it is profitable for them to do so. And so we first think that the problem is a little bit complicated for them because they have to pay their workers more than the workers make if they stay in cottage industries. And this is our wage bill line, W2. So we have to pay the workers the W2, which is higher than the income of one, in order to induce them to decide to leave their homes where they're 
producing sandals at home or some other activity and come to the factory. We'll just assume this is what we call a compensating differential that the workers would rather work at home than move to the factory. So we have to pay enough for them to think that it's a good idea to do so. And that's W2. And so then the question is whether this is profitable. The next thing they have to worry about is, well, how much would we produce? And of course, that's going to be something along their production function. But if the number of actual activities that we have, n is large, a thousand, let's say, then the extra money that the workers are making producing sandals, it's some extra money, but not very much of it is going to go into buying more sandals. So as a very reasonable first approximation, the entrepreneur might think, well, okay, I'm going to go in and I'm, I'm hoping to be able to sell all the sandals, but I can't sell more sandals that are already being produced. And so that'll be Q1. And so what we do is to say, well, we will produce Q1, but we certainly won't use more labor than we have to since we have to pay them a wage. So we look along the production function And we see, as a thought experiment, this focuses our attention on this point labeled A. It's just a thought experiment uh, label. It's not an area where the economy would actually produce. It's a way of the entrepreneur thinking or representing their thinking about whether to produce in this modern technique um, as an entrepreneur or not. And so they will first be able to find their revenue because they'll be producing the same amount, Q1, as, the, uh, as was done with the traditional sector, cottage industry production. The um, price has been normalized to one, so this is the value of their production. And so that's their revenue, and then in order to find profits, the other question is, of course, what is their costs? Well, there's only one kind of cost here, and that's the cost of labor. And so they will see at this amount of labor hired, what will be the corresponding amount of wage that they have to pay. This is the amount of labor that they hire. We go and look up here at the wage bill line, this W-2 line, to find out how much they will um, have to, uh, to uh, Pay, and that is given by this point here. So we just look at the amount of labor, we go up to the wage bill line, it looks like these two lines cross here, that's just a coincidence. We look over here and we see that the wage amount that has to be paid is in fact greater than the amount of revenue that we make, so we would lose money so we don't enter. And so all the other activities might have a potential entrepreneur who make the same kind of, of a judgment, but they find indeed they would not make money. Just the same kind of analysis. So there's no entrance at all of modern producers. And that's one equilibrium. You stay stuck if you want. Stock depends upon social welfare valuations of it, but you remain in cottage industry type production and don't change that. The other possible equilibrium to look at in this framework is one in which we have industrialization across all of the different activities, chairs and all the other things. In this case, we know that we have all N sectors now producing with an entrepreneur, with a modern factory. And so with consumers still liking each good equally, we have L over N as the amount of workers that can work in our activity, which we've taken as our example to be the sandal production. But now, looking at our production function, we see that we can produce with these workers a value of now Q2. And of course, we would hope that having industrialized, the amount and value of output will be greater now as represented here. 
now we have this additional question of whether or not we are profitable. So just as before, we have to look at, well, with the amount of labor that we are hiring, which is now greater than it was at point A, with the amount of laborers that we are hiring, what costs do we have in terms of wages we must pay? We see the answer to that looking at the wage bill. Correspondingly, this is the total cost that we face. Our only cost is wage, and that's the total amount of, of uh, wage bill that we have to pay. What's different here now is that there is positive profit. Of course, that would have to be the end of the story or it wouldn't have been much of a story. In the other equilibrium, it is stable because for this firm and for the other firms also, there's net positive profit. This is revenue and this is cost. If there's positive profit, there's no incentive for any producer to leave the market. Why would you? And so it's a stable equilibrium. Then the only remaining question is whether or not it can be Pareto ranked. Is this better than, about the same as, or worse than what we had before? Well, the case here is that it is a Pareto improvement because no one is worse off and some are better off. Those who are better off are clearly these entrepreneurs who make profits. The potentially indifferent, not changed, are those who are the workers, who are paid a higher wage, but in order to make this a somewhat more complicated problem, somewhat more difficult to show that this could be Pareto preferred, we've said that they're no happier with these wages. That's a compensating differential. So. If you want to think about an equilibrium in which literally everybody is better off, it's quite plausible to do so. If you're able to tax part of these high, maybe, profits at perhaps 50% profit rate, 25% profit rate, whatever it might be, those revenues can then be used to produce um, uh, goods for public goods for people, you can build schools, you can hire teachers, you can build clinics, you can have health services for people, and the result is you're using some of those uh, profits to improve welfare in the society overall, and in particular to also raise the utility, if you want, of those who are the workers. They also get these new public benefits, like schools for their children. And so this is how we are able to go beyond just showing that there are to stable equilibria plausibly in the question of economic development, but actually see the underlying logic about how the modernization equilibrium can be Pareto preferred because it leaves everyone better off. And I will there leave it off and look forward to our discussion about this. Thanks.